Great. Hi, everyone, and welcome. My name is Christiana Manzacco, and I'm the Director of Government Marketing with Deal Room. We just want to thank you all so much for coming to our latest in the Deal Room Talk series. Today, we'll be discussing the new data-driven trade and investment and exploring the role that data plays in foreign direct investment, or FDI. There's going to be a lot of acronyms coming at you in this presentation, so I hope you're ready for it. So it's not an easy task to attract the best and brightest talent to your region, and the stakes are very high. From opportunity identification to prospecting and attracting world-leading companies, investors, and talent, data matters. And there's also so many variables at play when trying to balance the two missions of attracting foreign companies and also maintaining the right business environment in your domestic ecosystem. There's also an overwhelming amount of economic indicators and policy data to consider and honing in on the right focus areas to grow prosperity in your region can be complex. Today, we'll hear from professionals who contemplate these challenges every day. But before we begin our panel session, we'd like to share some of DealRoom's insights to set the stage for our discussion. So the first question that we want to ask is, why hunt for high growth companies? Many of you are already very aware of the reasons, but let me convey the true value that startups bring to an ecosystem with data. So scale-ups matter because they create huge economic prosperity for a region. They're the core generators of economic value in a startup ecosystem, and they employ the largest number of people by orders of magnitude. So let's consider here the findings from a recent collaboration between DealRoom and Nordic Innovation. So of the more than 30,000 companies, startups active in the Nordics currently, so that includes Sweden, Finland, Denmark, Norway, and Iceland, um, of the companies we identified, only 5,200 of them employed more than 10 people. So approximately one sixth of the entire startup ecosystem. So if we then consider the top 1,000 scale-ups within that population, we see a very exciting and surprising trend unfolding, which is that the top 1,000 Nordic scale-ups generate 71% of the total enterprise value of the entire Nordic startup ecosystem. So these 1,000 companies alone account for $275 billion of the total $386 billion generated by the entire ecosystem. So it's this economic power that makes attracting scaling companies to our region so important. Next slide, thank you. Um, but beyond economic output, we know that having a critical mass of maturing companies in our ecosystem creates a flywheel effect that has a fantastic impact upon ecosystem growth. The talent that's working for successful startups learns the ropes there and then goes on to found their own companies with a higher rate of success. Also, these successful founders and leadership teams then go on to become the next generation of investors and mentors who then nurture up and coming startups and impart very crucial real world advice from the people who've actually been there and done that. And we can see in this slide how former employees from mature Dutch companies and unicorns have gone on to found a whole new cohort of up and coming and established companies. And we've seen this phenomenon happen in Silicon Valley, uh, like with the PayPal mafia, and now in the EU with N26 mobile bank employees as well. So the next question we have is, how do we find these companies? And as I'm sure the expert panelists today will tell us, there's no one magic bullet strategy that helps uncover high quality prospects, but instead it's a mix of tools that make it possible to achieve the mandates of each of our organizations. And so we need to consider the startup life cycle in this. As we all know, having up-to-date startup and scale-up data is a complex challenge and it seems like a never-ending pursuit uh, to have up-to-date data, particularly because these, these companies are moving through the stages of development very quickly 
from inception to breakout, scaling, to becoming unicorns, hopefully, and beyond. So being able to track this growth and reach out at that sweet spot in their development can be very important. Next slide, please. So this is one of the many reasons that we created Dealroom Signal, which is a predictive intelligence algorithm that provides a ranking of the top startups to watch based on their metrics, fundraising speed and timeline, growth indicators, founding team, and also a number of other factors. So if you're curious to learn more about our deal room signal, check out the link here using the QR code. And for those who are already subscribers to deal room, you can see it right from your dashboard and you can actually make your own lists of specific companies. Um, for those who aren't already, we can provide several top 100 lists that are geographically focused or industry or vertical focused that you can explore. So one of these top lists is one we recently published um, in the DAC region, which includes Germany, Austria, and Switzerland. So we can see from li this list here how the region is maturing and how it's now home to a large cohort of rising star companies and about 89 tech unicorns. And so you can see from this list, which is purely data-driven, which companies are the most high growth across a variety of metrics. We also pub published um, many other lists focused on specific industries. And a great example of this is FinTech. And the reason particularly that FinTech is so interesting is that it actually is the biggest sector for VC funding. It attracted 20% of all investments um, over the last year. And FinTech companies raised a staggering $128 billion in investments last year. There's now more than 500 fintech unicorns globally. So in this top 100 list, we can see that startups and scale-ups um, are geographically distributed, but um, about 33 of them are in the US, about 31 in Europe, and the rest are scattered across India, Latin America, Canada, and beyond. So this geographic diversity can make it tough to find the most promising companies when you're looking at them on a global scale. Um, but a real benefit of this particular tool is that it helps to filter through um, all of that noise and even, even especially to surface previously overlooked companies that maybe you would not have ever found about otherwise. Next slide. So in this presentation, we touched upon some of the data from recent reports, um, including reports that actually haven't even been launched yet. So if you're curious to hear more about this research and this intelligence as it's published, we encourage you definitely to check out our thought leadership and research tab. Um, we have reports on all different geographies um, and startup ecosystems, as well as specific industries that might interest you. So now uh, let's get into the meat of the topic with our panelist session. So in this edition of Dealroom Talks, we're gonna hear the stories of trade and investment organizations from around the world and learn about the specific tools and techniques that are up their sleeves. So as if we could make this even more challenging, I mean, a global pandemic made the FDI game um, quite complex and demanded creative approaches to find the best opportunities, whether that was finding companies or finding investors or those interested in investing in your region. So now that we're back to normal a little bit more and we have the resurgence of in-person events, how have trade and investment organizations changed their approach and what techniques have stuck? So to talk about this here with us today, uh, we have three expert panelists, the first being Olivier H. Rivas, who is the Director of Business Development and Entrepreneurship with Montreal International. Olivier is the lead contact for founders who wish to relocate to Montreal to launch a new venture. His experience as a lawyer with global client leadership experience, he brings that to his current role, where he serves as a trusted partner to decision makers of various functions who are looking into an increased footprint in Greater Montreal. Then we have with us Megan Blanton, Investment Advisor with Invest Alberta. Megan is currently based in San Francisco and serving as one of the bridges for investment opportunities between Alberta and one of Canada's biggest trading partners and allies, the United States. 
focused on investment attraction activities in the province, she has an eye on a variety of sectors in tech, including agriculture, climate, mobility, and entertainment. And then lastly, we have Pedro Teixeira, Partnerships Manager at Startup Lisboa. Pedro is responsible for the partners and projects at Startup Lisboa, managing a network of 100 plus partners and connecting them to the 100 plus startups that Startup Lisboa incubates. Great. So we're going to start our panel discussion here, um, but I also want to let everyone know that we're going to have time for Q&A after. So if questions come up throughout the panel, and I hope that they do, um, please put them in the chat and we'll just keep those aside for a few minutes afterward. And one last little housekeeping item um, is that we will also have networking right after the session. So um, just keep that in mind and we'll give you more instructions after. So great. Hello everyone. It's so nice to have you here and, and thanks for your time today. Um, early morning for Megan. Um, and Olivier, and afternoon for Pedro. So we have a pretty global crew of folks from around the world. Um, so first question, so how has the world of FDI changed over the last three years? And are there new ways of working that arose during the pandemic that have remained now? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 certainly changed uh, quite a bit for the last three years. And but what uh, remains, I think, in my perspective, is that uh, building strong relationships is really at the core. And so our approach, um, you know, with respect to using data is really making sure. In fact, the premise uh, is always that you have the right data. And so when you're when you want to build a relationship with someone or just uh, want to approach an executive, a founder, an investor, um, you want to have a well-crafted message. And so personally, I use data as information to not necessarily that we do extreme or massive modeling uh, exercises to, to come up with some sort of uh, forecast, but rather just to make sure that we own our message and we can um, uh, have it relate to the person we're uh, communicating with, basically. Yeah, we, we felt the same way. So basically here we felt that in the in the three years that passed, uh, we have seen that the behavior that we saw mainly on the startups and on the ecosystem turned really different. So the way that you manage the communities, the way that you relate with the ecosystem really changed, not just in the ecosystem of startups. So all the, the, the ways that we used to work and the physical ways that we used to work, the physical events that we had, uh, and all that community that was created physically uh, changed a bit. Uh, I'll give you an example. For example, here in the building of Startup Lisboa, we see uh, that the movement that we had uh, was not even closer to the one that we see nowadays. And that doesn't mean that uh, the work that we do and that the value that we uh, are giving to the startups uh, will be less, uh, but will be less if we don't adapt uh, to, to it. And we are seeing that for uh, giving a better relation and a, val a better value proposition to the startups, what we have to do is that what Olivier uh, was also talking about, to have like a concise message. And since the relations are way more, uh, are way faster than they were, uh, you have like a time span of 15 minutes for you to catch up uh, with all the messages that you want to pass uh, to uh, the ones that you are relating uh, so it has to be all faster so having all the data having all the message concise to them uh, makes it way easier for us to approach the time spent that they are reaching to i think it's also dependent um, i'm interested to see who's in the audience and where everyone is geographically right because we're all approaching this in slightly different ways and last few years like our world's just got really small and so trying to understand what the challenges were for businesses um, in particular, like I'm looking at the Bay area tech market and um, trying to sell Canada as a solution. And so it's changed in a way that yes, talent was still um, one of the biggest problems for companies here, but it, the nearshoring um, remote hybrid model kind of became the norm. Right. And so the, the challenge then is how does economic development adapt to that and, and support companies in that way? Um, measure these kinds of projects, but make sure we're still solving problems for the end client. Um, and I think it's been interesting too, because I'll be honest, like 
I had to rebuild my network again for the, for the third time over the last three years to make sure I'm talking to the right companies and having those relationships rather than competing with everybody who's doing economic development in the Bay Area. There's loads, right? And we're all getting our elbows out. But um, having those relationships and having a, having an identity is important. And um, even for, for at least the U.S. and Canada, the, the idea of the borders kind of melted away and it just became a, a pitch for at least what I'm looking at is, is Canada and talent is great. And that's the primary goal there. And a follow-up question to that. So, um, you know, now we're going back to in-person events, right? So does it still feel like those borders have kind of melted away? Like, are you still finding it's just very easy to take a global perspective or has that changed now that we're going back to kind of normal? It feels like a to be determined, at least right now it does for me. It feels like this is the way it's going to be going forward. Companies are getting more comfortable with having the operations around supporting remote hybrids. So it makes sense. And, you know, everyone is kind of looking over their shoulders to see like, is, the, is this really how we're going to do it permanently? And then how do we put the structure around it? Um, but I, I don't know for you guys if it's different. Yeah, I feel the same. So I, I feel that the way that we have looked at all the initiatives that uh, we were developing uh, had to be renewed uh, and the pandemic was just a way for us to renew it. not just these digital processes that we uh, we have done like 20 years from from now uh, in a non-digital way and that we were forced to, to develop with so I think it's uh, one of the positive things out of the many negatives that the pandemic brought but one of the positive things that emerged that is that it created different connections and also uh, shaped some of the companies, some of the organizations and uh, obliging them to like renew what they were doing and to rethink uh, the strategy that they have. And for us, we are feeling that in terms of community, we have to create like events and specific things where people have interest to come and not separate them in different initiatives throughout the year, throughout the week. Uh, so have like a concise and uh, a good one and a good event for uh, emerging all the people in the same time with a, with a value wall concise in it. So the people, I think people is looking at the time and the traveling and everything uh, in a different way that they were seeing because they can do it digitally. Uh, we can do this panel digitally now and probably 10 years ago we wouldn't do it and we would do it physically. So for us to gather these kind of people, uh, it would be difficult uh, for us to organize the panel. So I think people are seeing a lot of things different and that's the, the to be defined that I agree a lot with Megan because we don't know the road that uh, is ahead. We are trying to do different initiatives and search for the data for uh, the, the guys that are attending and if it's being valuable for them or not. Yeah, for us, I mean, uh, you look at what's going on with respect to tech companies hiring remotely. We're, we have to, we're still in, um, in, in brainstorming mode, uh, mode in the sense that we, um, uh, I think there's going to be a challenge there to sort of attach the, uh, th those, that new reality to the tax credits that we have in Quebec and in Montreal, which are pretty competitive, you know, worldwide. Um, in that sense, I see working re remotely um, for, for, for tech folks as very positive and, and, and possible uh, in Montreal. Um, but with, with respect to, to attending events and being able to, to really, uh, again, build relationships, I think that you, the human interaction is, is, is still can be, can be beat uh, by, by a, 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 you know, webinars and, and all that stuff. So. Um, I look forward to just being able to, to, to travel again and, and, and attend events again, for sure. Um, and uh, so next question, we talked about this a little bit with respect to, you know, making sure you're prepared for a conversation um, with a company or with an investor. I mean, clearly on that side of things, data plays an important role. Um, but I am curious to know, like, how does data factor into your day-to-day -day role? I'll jump in on that one. <laughs> I'd be really bold saying that I use data as if it's like uh, armor for me to go out and get stuff. And then when I actually think about that question, then I'm like, well, I, I am actually looking at different platforms and trying to see what companies are doing fast growth. And you start to just realize that 
uh, if you've been doing this for a while, like I have, you start to look for patterns, right? So companies that have raised a certain round, hiring a certain number of people, particular technology where there's value propositions without even realizing it. Um, and so you can do it in various ways, but it's always really good to have an organization that understands that feeding you the data as part of your role and being able to see what's happening in trends is, is really important. So um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Yeah, same, same here. And just, uh, you know, being able to understand what are the trends. I took some notes, uh, Christiana, thank you for, for uh, I was not actually aware of that, that 20% of the VC uh, funding was was uh, was in fintech. I think it's pretty interesting, uh, especially when you look at what's going on in Lisbon with Web3 and, and crypto and all that. Uh, this is a sector that we're, uh, I wouldn't say bullish, but I think there's a lot of um, uh, opportunity in Montreal for this, just because of the, uh, the 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 kind of network we have with respect to gaming, uh, visual effects, uh, and 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 the financial services more more largely. Um, but yeah, I mean, so those those type that type of data, I think, is very relevant in 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 conversations you want to bring forward with uh, entrepreneurs, investors, and uh, executives. And so, uh, for for me, uh, understanding those trends uh, is very important. Yeah, from our side, it's the same. So it's feeling that we live in an era that the data is available and a lot of data. And what is important is for you to have the right sources uh, with the quality data. So the one who has it uh, will probably succeed faster than the others. So having, for example, in the part of the scouting that we do, we, we really use uh, deal room and other platforms as well uh, to, to check uh, for the good and quality startups and for the first uh, triage that we do to the startups and the first part of the scouting that we do to the startups that we want to incubate here at Startup Lisboa. It's really important to have a platform or to have uh, a, a tool that allows you to have like quality sources. Otherwise, you would be wasting time uh, searching a lot of things that could be wrapped up uh, in, in just one platform and could do the first part of the job that you that other people is using and it's going faster than you. Uh, in that in that side, so it's a, a thing that it's involved on our side uh, all the day to day, and in a way dynamic world that we are living, uh, having quality data analyzed is uh, is gold. Absolutely. Okay, so changing gears a little bit. So, what emerging trends are each of you seeing in the market, and what's exciting to you right now? Olivier, I know you talked about Web3, crypto. Those are some industries you're bullish on. Um, I'd love to hear in general what else you're seeing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. So, so I think there's a few, there's a few fun. So over the years in Montreal and, and, and in Quebec, and I guess in Canada to some extent, uh, we were lucky enough to have good amounts of, of venture capital being raised uh you know in the last decade several funds were able to run to to, to, to fund new funds and um and 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 one of those funds is uh is some of those funds are um, venture focus or, or brand themselves as being uh, venture builders and i think um some that we have here in montreal really work on uh on the financial services uh side of things and so, to that end, I think uh, that fintech is certainly part of the part of the mix. Um, but because of the of the tax credits that exist, for instance, in gaming and 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 B two B and software development, uh, there's also a very uh, I think competitive or, or, or uh, opportunity, uh, loosely speaking, for uh, Web three. And uh, this summer, we uh, saw the, the 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 announcement of uh, Lighthouse, for instance. Which uh, really try to to build the, uh, the 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 connections between all the metaverses that are out there, and so I think that talent uh, in in gaming and in fintech will really drive many opportunities for us to attract companies in in fintech and, and crypto and Web three, and so I have a particular interest in those. Uh, with that in mind, for the last four years. Uh, especially with, uh, I know, Megan, you know, Mark, uh, Mark was instrumental in us being able to attract uh, the big tech companies out there. Uh, but beyond just being the big tech companies coming to Montreal, they decided to come to Montreal because of what was being uh, developed for 
uh, artificial intelligence and so AI. Um, a lot of it re uh, being reliant on uh, researchers that are that have worldwide uh, reputation. And so uh, AI is, uh, is certainly uh, a, a sector that we want to continue being very competitive and very, uh, and thrive, uh, you know, have success in. Um, in the last, uh, I'd say that a, an, er an area, a sub area of Montreal that is, um, that is exciting for us is called the Myland, um, where lots of uh, AI labs have, uh, have opened up shop in the last four years. And so we will look at some uh, other growing companies that want to um, build stronger capacities uh, in that field uh, to, to, to reach out to, if that makes sense. Uh, <laughs> oops, sorry. Oh, sorry. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay, um, I was just going to say I'm glad you mentioned AI because uh, Web3, obviously, on the crypto side, it's great. Hopefully you're with an organization that's comfortable working in that space. It gets a little political. In the meantime, everything else is being driven by AI. I also can see um, a lot of activity around electrification. We've all shifted to talking about that and then de-risking supply chains. But um, for those who aren't familiar with the, the Canada story, um, we have uh, some AI super clusters, Mila in Montreal being one of the biggest names known Toronto, and then as well as University of Alberta and Edmonton. And so using that as a hook, right, with tech companies who were, the talent isn't available, they need access to that research to solve some of the big problems. Like that's really exciting. And we can see a lot of new stuff with that. And since I've been with the province of Alberta, Invest Alberta for a month and a half, I'd say even just the thing that gets me excited is I'm learning a lot about energy, which is a new file for me, but, um, pretty cool to see applications and even around some of the nuclear um, small reactors and things um, because it's all AI driven and we're just trying to solve some of those big problems around energy. I, I think everyone's seen, unfortunately, in the last uh, few months of what's been happening with oil and gas prices and that we're still reliant on it. And so trying to find some of those solutions where we can get past that, um, put carbon capture um, projects together has me... Um, keeps me up at night and I'm trying to figure out how it all works, but it's pretty exciting. Yeah, uh, so we are feeling uh, quite the same. So Web3 is being one of the, the most uh, relevant things here in Portugal nowadays because of the community ran away. And I think this is compared also uh, to what Olivier and Megan were saying because uh, we saw that in, in some common markets from the startups, uh, the ecosystems got uh, a little bit uh, closed and the regulation got a little bit rushed uh, in terms of what they were uh, expecting. So they merged to the, the markets that had uh, the best ecosystems uh, in terms of other startups and uh, that has less regulation that allows them to create and to experiment different things and to implement the different things uh, in, the, in, the, in the markets. And that's one of the cases that we see here in Lisbon. So the community is it's growing a lot. Uh, in that in that areas, uh, deep tech is also one of the areas that is evolving, and all the things that are associated uh, to it. Uh, we are seeing that our communities that go uh, wider and 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 wider, but mainly Web three is one of the areas that it's emerging. Uh, it doesn't mean that it will succeed in the future. It, it means that nowadays is the one uh, that is uh, most uh, dynamic in terms uh, of the the ecosystems and uh, most evolving. And we are seeing a lot of events here as well, NearCon, Wild Summit, so uh, Binance coming here as, as well. So different uh, different areas, different companies that are moving a lot the market uh, and that are making the trends also go, go, go different. And it is also explained uh, because uh, of the ecosystem and the pandemic changed a little bit the way of people looked uh, in the countries that they were uh, working. And I think people really uh, started looking way more to the quality of life and not just uh, to the quality of work that they had. And this is one of the things that Lisbon offered as well to people. And that's why we are seeing a lot of nomads, a lot of expats coming to, to Lisbon because the conditions of the country uh, are way, way cooler. And even uh, working remote, uh, with a salary remote from other country here in Lisbon, it feels like a king. So uh, it's way cooler 
uh, to have also that conditions allow allied to the ecosystem uh, that makes it easier to put, for the people to move to move here. So it's good. There's a lot. There's a lot to say really about uh, what's coming up uh, in the next few years. Uh, if yeah. I can add just uh, very briefly to Pedro's point, I think, um, you know, I guess what I meant to say uh, when speaking about Web3 and crypto is um, because of the gaming talent pools, and I use a S because with, you know, Montreal being um, one of those places where there's just so many indies, indie studios, I think there's a, it's always a matter of how, ma how much uh, uh, or how many exchanges of ideas uh, you can you can you can have, and so the idea being that the next thing will be reliant on how many you know if you're in an area where you can share lots of ideas. And I think when there's many good networks of yeah. places to share ideas, where uh, that that's where really an area gets uh, uh, a competitive advantage. And 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 for that, I think Lisbon has done has done a tremendous job. And that's that, that's also Olivia. If you if you allow me, it's it's where people want to be. So you want to be where other people that is developing the same things as you uh, are. So you want to be with the community that is developing the same thing as you. And that's a thing that we really see in the ecosystem of startups outside in the corporate world. Probably uh, you see a different way uh, the the sharing part of the data that they have and everything. It's different, but here the trends get really similar because the community follows each other and work together to, to develop the ecosystem together. Yeah. 100%. Awesome. Sorry. Um, so coming off of the excitement of talking about the great things about each of these different areas, now let's change gears and talk a little bit about the challenges. So what would you say are the biggest challenges for trade and investment professionals and what's keeping you up at night right now? I think following this conversation is knowing where the talent is and knowing uh, where uh, it is the, the, the proper things for them to invest. So it's a fast paced market, a fast paced uh, environment and for them to know where uh, for them to be placed, even in terms of countries and in terms of cities. Uh, there are some some cities that remained uh, some uh, points of attra attraction uh, for the startups, uh, but we are seeing that even that ones are uh, shaking a bit. So that's one of the reasons that it's different also for uh, the part of the investment to know where to be, where to position and who whom to talk uh, to have this data of the good quality source uh, for them to, to invest on. And to add to that, I mean, absolutely, knowing where the talent is and being able to offer that as a, as a solution is probably one of the biggest uh, issues, right? And if, if you are trying to get to know your customer and have something to offer, I mean, depending on what regions you represent, if there's incentives and things, those are nice to have, at least in the market I'm in. They're, it's not exactly, decisions aren't made just based on like cost and price. It's talent, quality of life, things like that. Um, so that's definitely something you need to know and be able to have it as a tool. And I think if I'm going to be honest as well, I think another challenge is just shifting with the way the course has gone in the last few years. And I think, you know, I've come across some other economic development folks who are feeling a little bit of like irrelevancy, right? If you're not actually the person that's help helping with the remote hybrid story, how do we get behind it? And I have to give um, credit to Toronto Global. Um, they've put together a new measurement of how they're, how they're looking at like the remote hybrid story and how to measure those jobs and investment value in the region so that we can continue to work with these companies without being afraid of like, well, we didn't have these rules before. So how do we measure it? And if I'm not part of this story, then I'm out of it. And I just, I don't buy that. I still think that having the relationships and having um, some solutions for, for companies that might not necessarily even know that there's other ways to do it than remaining local and, and just following some of the trends. Yeah, and I mean, I don't yeah, know if Global is with us today, but I'm sure they'd be very happy to hear that shout out. But I mean, Megan, can you elaborate a little bit more on what that initiative looks like and what they're doing well? Yeah, I, I should preface it with um, 
it came across our as a conversation when we were um, meeting with Calgary Economic Development. They have a deeper relationship with Toronto Global, and so we're all just saying, why don't we all get on the same page? It's it's exhausting trying to be competitive and everybody using different calculators. And I don't even want to get into that conversation. But if we're all looking at this and trying scratching our heads and trying to say, well, this is the way the direction is going now. And if companies are the clients in the end, how can we actually help them do this rather than trying to make it fit in our old way? So right now, I don't have a ton of details on how they're doing it, but um, I'm happy to speak with them. And if it's something that anyone else is interested in looking at, like, let's let's make a little side conversation and and share what we're learning um, as we're out there. Thanks, Anna. <laughs> Uh, well, I agree with uh, the, uh, Pedro and Megan's po Megan's points. Uh, you know, talent, uh, being able to identify uh, rock star talent, the talent that is not just available but also uh, that has uh, lots of experience is 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 key. Uh, I guess I'd add to that uh, immigration. A lot of my job has been to to you know make articulate programs to founders because in Canada it can get a little bit more complicated when you own a business to move here. Uh, but it's it's doable. There's programs. It's just a matter of being able to understand the right paths. Um, uh, and another challenge I, I'd say is uh, maybe um, and it's a challenge, and at the same time, it's an opportunity. It's just a way of presenting it. Uh, is 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 being Montreal being you know French and English? We uh, we have um, we we want to make sure that we convey the right message and that people. Uh, and companies that come to Montreal understand that there's an opportunity really for increasing your 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 uh, your capacity of, of uh, being multilingual. And so uh, that has been a challenge. It's not keeping me uh, up at night, but it's uh, it's something uh, I want to I want to share I want to share with the companies we work with. Sorry. Well, Pedro, what are you grappling with? Yeah, in terms of this area, so basically, uh, it's it's a thing that we're saying. So, the talent that we have and the right pace that you enter in terms of the startups uh, is what matters. So, getting in the right timeline, getting in, and in terms of the investment, I think it's the most important part for you to to make sure that you are entering at the exact time. And the spend that you have for investing in a startup is not that long. So even if you are focused pre-seed seed, uh, it will be even more difficult uh, because if you are focusing on that areas, it's like a six month span for you to invest them. And if you are not uh, opening the market and knowing the solutions that you have, you'll have to enter in a, a longer round uh, and you'll have to put more money that you should uh, if you invested in the beginning and if you have betted in something that has more risk, but also more reward involved on it. Yeah. And just a follow up question to that. So how important is timing to your work, like making sure you're liaising with companies at the right time in their development, uh, getting in touch with investors at that right time, that sweet spot? Yeah, I think it's the most important part uh, that the investors also ask from from our side as an incubator. So we are a source as, for example, the room is a source of pipeline of uh, startups that we can go and search and what is happening with them and uh, the the signal it's it's one of the the things that we are using a lot as well to see the right time and, and i think it's really useful for us to also evaluating and have an indicator with the startups but it we use deal room and the investors use us uh, to do like the the shortcut in terms of the right startups that they should invest on so that's one of the things that we we see that it's the most important part that we are seeing way, way more the investors coming to us and say, OK, do you believe that this will be a good startup? And if we say yes, they do the bet way earlier they, that they uh, would have done uh, before. So it's a, a, a trend that is getting uh, quite the market. It's more dynamic, more investors, more and more startups involved. So they have to, to, to trust in someone that can do that, that, that part of the work uh, and that can give them the, the competitive advantage uh, between the, all the investors uh, that are involved in it. So, yeah. Okay. All right. So let's move on to the next question. So 
what creative solutions have you come up with? To, if any, I'm sure you have many though, um, to overcome some of these challenges that you're facing. So you don't have to tell me your secret sauce, but uh, I'm sure you've come up with some creative approaches. I don't mind hopping in here. Um, so I'd already mentioned um, sharing kind of information and resources with, with others, right? Um, and I should say to the audience too, if you guys have any uh, ways of that you're looking at this that you want to talk about maybe in the Q and A or put in comments. Like I'm very interested in what everyone else is doing and continuing to learn. So I, I wouldn't say that I have anything that's really like profound, right? But um, you know, given that everybody is kind of eager to travel and start participating in stuff, the contacts that I'm trying to to lure in, right, are not going to tech conferences anymore. There's a little bit of an exhaustion around that. So how do you get them to look at your market? And so one thing that um, I'm focusing on is trying to create a little bit more of like serendipitous moments for um, some of the decision makers. Um, we've got the BAMP Venture Forum coming up um, next month. And so it's, it's actually surprising to see how many investors are really interested in coming up because they actually get to be in a room to find other investors in market who can they can do co-investments with. I've spent a lot of time trying to find a way to help like show the deal flow to investors and it's almost impossible sometimes. Like I can really feel like I'm hitting my head against the wall. So if I can help actually put other investors and let them have those conversations, maybe we'll see um, if, it, if there's a difference. But in the meantime, at least it's saying like come to Alberta, that our doors are open um, and there seems to be uh, a lot of interest. So that, that's one. Yeah, I can hardly uh, relate more to, to your point, Megan, is uh, sometimes making sure that you bring good deal flow to the investors is, is a way of, you know, uh, facilitating co-investments is, is pretty hard, but it's certainly part of what I try to do. Uh, thanks for, for mentioning the band venture from, I'll certainly look it up. Um, but besides that, I guess our approach has always been and will continue to be, um, you know, Make sure that uh, the you're the contact person you're you're communicating communicating with is coming to Montreal most of the time. And I can't Mark probably has that statistic, and I don't. Uh, but it's uh, it's pretty strong where one uh, when one investor uh, comes to Montreal, it's it's almost likely that he will uh, get some sort of footprint here. So uh, I don't know. Is it the food? Is it? It's probably not the tax credits. <laughs> Uh, probably not me or Mark either, but there's something that we do well, I guess, that makes uh, that 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 makes uh, you know investors invest. So we want to bring we want to bring them to Montreal. Physically, I physically I meant. Yeah. So from our side, to overcome the the challenge uh, is to create the community or to continue to to develop the community. So. But now in a different way, uh, as we were talking, uh, the way of managing a community and having a community in a city is way different than the one uh, that you that you saw uh, before the pandemic. And now you see that it's really different. But I think it's it continues to be the the key point uh, in terms of every ecosystem. So to guarantee that in a city, in a country, in a place you have. Uh, the right people that can help them uh, with the right problems that they are they are having, and also be meaningful in the in the value that you are uh, you are growing in in terms of the relations that you have. So to guarantee that for the investors you have the right startups, for the right startups you have the right partners and the right investors, for the right partners you have the right deal flow that they want to have. So to guarantee that in the whole ecosystem, all the ones are are happy and having the the thing that they they would want and need. And I think that's one of the easiest things that we have in the ecosystem because as we don't uh, compete a lot inside of the ecosystem, it tends to be always a win-win relation. That's not that many in terms of when it's competing country against country and attracting uh, different startups and different investors as well. Because if they go to one side, it's difficult that they go uh, to, to the other one as well. But I think it it grows uh, value, for example, for me to be related uh, with Olivier and to Megan and for us to exchange the startups that we have. Because I think one of the things that we are seeing is that it's impossible for you to retain the startups in your country if they want to expand. So they start developing a startup because they want to have a scalable thing. They want to have a scalable business. And for them to scale, it's impossible for them to stay only in their country. So you have to have these relations, you have to have these international partnerships as well. 
and growing that community. And for them to know that if they will ask me to move uh, to Montreal with Olivier, I will have the connection with him uh, to, to exchange the startups and to provide them a, a hotspot for them there. And they will be happy with it. Yeah, that's a really powerful message. And I love seeing the opportunity for collaboration among this panel and also with some of the audience members. Um, I think sometimes we get into the headspace that trade and investment and economic development is all about competition and we're all in competition with each other. And I think in some ways that can be true, but um, these global connections are very valuable to the communities that you all serve as well. Um, so that's really great to hear. To hear. I see a lot of uh, reciprocity with Lisbon. Um, you know, one of the companies that we announced this summer uh, was um, uh, Brazil uh, booking uh, travel travel booking uh, company called Herb, and so they chose Montreal as uh, their um, as a place for uh, for them to open an AI lab uh, this summer. And their other innovation lab, um, AI innovation lab, was in Lisbon. So. Uh, I can imagine, yeah, I can imagine a lot of um, of, of uh, other opportunities where we'd be able to to, to collaborate. Amazing. And I mean, we all know Lisbon has so much to offer. Web Summit coming up and then also hearing about the Band Venture Forum. <laughs> Just, I love hearing that. Um, and I'm sure they'll be so happy to get that shout out as well. Um, so actually, I have a follow up for Megan. So Megan, moving from being the director of Silicon Valley with Trade and Invest BC and now working for Invest Alberta, um, how has your approach to attracting investors changed? I'm still trying to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you're like a month and a half. No, it's OK. It's a good question. I think um, in general, like the value proposition is different, although I was saying earlier that, you know, the border is kind of fade away and, and companies are looking at Canada in general. But the problems that we're trying to solve in Alberta are slightly different than British Columbia. British Columbia has a very um, easy sell to the Valley just because of Vancouver to our flight talents there and then access to um, uh, access to Asia. Whereas um, with Invest Alberta, it's, it's a little bit more of, and I don't know if there's oil and gas people on this, but uh, transitioning um, the ecosystem in complement to oil and gas with um, with other technologies. And I think in general, the province uh, uh, across the board would agree with that. And it's a really important time to be doing it. So uh, I would say it's, it's more of like trying to understand initially, it was looking at what, what problems were around talent and how to solve that into like put how to put all the pieces together and all the players to make some of these larger scale projects work and they've been doing it already. And so what value can we add? And perhaps a little bit more of, uh, the solution now is on the regulatory side and trying to help just open those doors and companies come in and do the things that we need them to do. So still figuring that out, but um, it's a really good question. Just curious. Um, that's great. Okay. Um, do any of you have questions for the other panelists? Anything we haven't covered so far that's kind of in your mind? Uh, I do for, for Montreal. Are you guys doing the Formula One AI mission this year or is that off? <laughs> Good question. I'm not aware. <laughs> uh, no, I, I don't think we've done it uh, this summer, but uh, next year, I, I, I don't know. It'd be it'd probably, yeah, it'd, it'd be interesting if we could. I imagine that's definitely a draw. Um, and is anyone coming to Web Summit this year? <laughs> Pedro is. Yeah, from, from, my, from my side, from my it's side. An, an easy answer. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to attend. Uh, I'm not sure I'll, I'll be able to, to go, but uh, I certainly uh, have a colleague that will uh, that will attend. Yeah, same here. I wish wish it was me, but um, one of my HQ-based colleagues, um, Mike Adderall, will probably be going. Amazing. Okay, um, so with that, I think it's a good time to open it up to question and answer. So if anyone has any questions they'd like to pose to our expert panelists, please feel free to drop a question in the chat. And if we don't get any, we will move to the networking stage of the presentation here.
No? Okay. Okay. So in that case, um, I think it's a great time to move to networking. We have um, a really intimate group of folks here um, from trade and investment organizations all around the world. Um, so please join us for speed networking. Um, so the way it works is you can either request to have a video call with specific people, or if you join the speed networking, it just kind of randomly pairs you with people for a short one-to-one -one video chat randomly. Um, so to find this, if you click on the people tab on the left side menu of your screen, that will bring you to the networking area. And then from there, if you click on speed networking, you can do the short one-to-one -one video chat um, or search for people specifically by their title or their name. So with that, we'd just like to say thank you all so much for attending today. Um, and we hope that if you have any follow-up questions for the panelists that you find time to chat with them afterward, um, or if it's okay with the panelists, we'd love to maybe include your email and people can reach out to you that way. Okay. Thank you so much for your time. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Thanks a lot.